Well, hello there, and welcome to 61B 2019 edition. So I'm going to talk a little bit in this video about what 61B is all about. And in the next couple of videos, we'll get going with the actual course. But just at a very broad level, what is 61B? Well, it's really about two things. One of them is writing programs that are efficient. So some programs out there, they use tons of memory and they're very slow. And then other programs that do the same task are faster and use less memory. And we're going to try and get you there to write programs that are more efficient. But the other really important thing is helping you be more efficient with your time. Because, well, you only have, I don't know, so much time in the universe. And ideally, you do not want to spend it doing things you don't want to do, like debugging some incredibly tedious program or whatever else, or or writing code and then having to rewrite it over and over. Uh, so what we're going to try and do is get you to operate in an efficient manner when you're writing code. We're going to do that in a bunch of different ways. One of those is we're going to use real world tools. So I'm a big proponent of using real world tools like IntelliJ, JUnit, things you'll see in this course. Because I think that, well, first of all, the skills will carry on to the rest of your life. But second, these tools exist for a reason. They're actually really good. and there's a trade-off because you'll find they're annoying at first, but in the long run you'll like them. And then more generally, we're just going to throw at you a very different style of problem than you would have seen in an earlier programming class most likely. Uh, I'm going to do a lot of problems where you're going to work on something totally from scratch as opposed to filling in the blanks, and you're also going to have to learn how to debug and even test such programs. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about ways we're going to do that in the course in a bit. But fundamentally, the class is those two things, efficient programs and efficient you. Now, we're assuming this is not a class that assumes you can come in with no prior programming knowledge. You should already have one pretty solid programming course under your belt, most likely CS61A at Berkeley, but it could be any number of other classes. It could be E7 at Berkeley, CS88 at Berkeley, or other intro programming courses from either online or other institutions. So the key things that I think it's great to know already uh, are having some sense of what object-oriented programming is. Uh, you should definitely be familiar with recursion. And lists and trees are two types of uh, ways to organize data that you should ideally have seen before, though you won't be totally wrecked uh, if you haven't seen them before. So why should you study algorithms and data structures? Like why, why is this the topic of this course? I talked a lot about efficient code and you being efficient, but what is it about algorithms and data structures that make that the focus of 61B? Well, as I alluded to on an earlier, on the previous slide, well, it turns out that having good algorithms and data structures is one of the most important tools for making code that runs efficiently, um, but there's a lot of other reasons out there. So one reason maybe is just peer pressure, right? So if we look at uh, what's going on with 61B enrollment, it is astounding to see how many more people are taking 61B than they were a decade ago. I mean, at the bottom of the last uh, cycle after the dot-com boom had ended, the class in an entire year was enrolling not even 300 students, but now we're looking at around 1,700 uh, trying to get into the course, and we're currently stuck at 1,600. And in the fall, we anticipate the class to be quite large as well, so that in a given year, we're enrolling something like 2,400 students. It's exciting times. It's a very interesting time to be teaching programming. Uh, and you guys sense all that energy and all the ways that, that this course is affecting the world. Well, what's some examples of that? Like, what, what is it about algorithms and data structures specifically that are affecting the world? Uh, well, it turns out that a lot of the stuff we take for granted, so let's open up a Google. Do, 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 got a lot of stuff open. OK, let's try typing in some stuff. Uh, how many? OK, so I type how many, and as soon as I press a single letter, Google has a bunch of suggestions, for example. I push P, and instantly it's like, great, I, I got some suggestions for you. And it's so fast, it's unbelievable. And it turns out that this is only possible because of certain data structures out there that are really amenable to what is known as the prefix matching problem. And in particular, the data structure that I'm pretty sure Google is using in this case is something known as a try. And we'll talk about it later in class. And it's pretty extraordinary to see just how fast an application like this can be, even though there are literally terabytes of data probably on the back end of this database. I'm going to the dentist later. Okay. Uh, 
Another reason? Well, algorithms obviously have an enormous impact on our world through social media. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see computer science moving into the central focus of a lot of politics and policy discussion these days. And one of the biggest ones is, for example, the stories that get served up on your Facebook feed. There's a really nice thing on the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they have a page called Blue Feed, Red Feed, where you can see how the algorithms at Facebook will show you different things depending on what it believes uh, your interests are. And you could basically see two different worlds completely. Another example is, well, uh, content discovery, right? This is a major business. And if you go into this world professionally, that is computer science, there's a pretty good chance you're going to end up working on problems like this, which are how do we recommend music to people on Spotify? And again, it's taking data about each user and trying to apply some kind of algorithm, in this case, some sort of machine learning. Uh, we're not gonna talk about machine learning in this class, but uh, the foundation that we build in this course, uh, upon that foundation is built all of the algorithms that are powering all the exciting machine learning stuff out there. Speaking of machine learning, uh, it's been absolutely astounding to see the progress of AI in the last decade. And one of the most uh, surprising examples to me was AlphaGo. So for a long time, the conventional wisdom was that a computer would never beat us humans at Go, or at least not anytime soon. But actually now, with algorithms that learn to play Go, that don't even have any specialized training, uh, they're, they're gener it's a generic algorithm that can learn how to play arbitrary types of turn-based games, and that arbitrary AI playing against itself is now the best Go player in the world. Uh, so we have AlphaGo, AlphaZero, many iterations thereof. And it's been amazing to see what machine learning has been able to do there. And I think that sort of thing, uh, that, that kind of really cutting edge AI, or even just algorithms at the center of our lives, are gonna be one of the biggest changes as we move forward as a civilization. Uh, and hopefully it's progress and not some sort of regression. But uh, yeah, the world's a change. One of the biggest ways this is gonna happen, of course, are self-driving cars. Um, I don't know when it's gonna happen exactly, but I would bet that in 20 years or so, most new cars, uh, or I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, I think most driving will be self-driving or at least uh, heavily assisted self-driving. Uh, and that is going to have just unbelievable impacts on the world. There's something like a million people killed in car crashes a year. And in theory, computer science might save most of those people from dying unnecessarily. And not to mention all the people who are injured or maimed in accidents. But there's a downside even there, which is that there's a whole lot of people whose living is made through driving. So even in the US, there's something like 5 million people who drive as uh, truck drivers or delivery drivers. And that's going to be obviously a huge impact on the economy if suddenly all of those jobs disappear, or at least most of them. And then even just in the natural sciences, it's amazing to see how algorithms are able to allow us to explore the world. So for example, uh, there was a news story from last year, uh, basically where the picture of um, migration into the Americas was changed because of uh, DNA that was found in an 11,000 year old uh, remains of an infant who died way back then. And these advanced phylogenetic algorithms are able to tell us something about the world. We can infer things that we never would have thought were possible in the past. Now, maybe you have less lofty aspirations, at least for the near future, than changing civilization. Uh, and so even just generically, one of the most important things about the, con the content of this course is that it's really fundamental to being a good programmer. It's a great means to an end, whatever the end may be, whether lofty or basic. Uh, and I think uh, Linus Torvalds, his, uh, one of the creators of Linux, well, the, the main guy, you know, he's the one after whom uh, Linux is named. Uh, he had this to say, the difference between a bad programmer and a good one is whether the programmer considers code or data structures more important. Bad programmers worry about the code. Good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships. So in this case, worrying about the code would be things that didn't necessarily matter quite as much, like, I don't know, how long the methods are, or you know how exactly all the classes are organized. Are you following these certain rigorous patterns, like the factory pattern or whatever? Uh, he says that the more important thing would be worrying about data structures and their relationships. And the way I think about it is that you, you should think about data structures and algorithms as your helpers. 
they do things that you don't need to worry about. Uh, it's kind of like you want someone to work on your house. You have some electrical problem. So the ideal thing to do is to hire an electrician. That is like a data structure in a sense. There's a certain set of things you can explain, like electrician, please help, there's sparks shooting out of my wall, uh, and the electrician will show up and fix them. A bad program would be somebody who maybe contracts out uh, someone who makes wires, uh, maybe someone who makes plastic sheathing, and, and basically tries to rebuild all of the technology that's already been done, uh, and therefore wastes all of their own time. They do a worse job, um, and it's very expensive. And so knowing what data structures are out there and what they're capable of will make your life much, much easier. And we'll see that in the projects in this class. Now, as you move forward uh, with data structures and algorithms, um, one of the things that I find particularly fascinating in the modern scientific landscape is that the that science, it's a lot of the major discoveries these days are not, oh, you know, I've discovered some formula, like the, the wave equation or whatever. Uh, often it is, I have compiled a bunch of data, I've built a model, I've run a simulation, and i built something that recapitulates some feature of the natural world. And that tells me I have some understanding. So for example, here's a simulation showing galaxy formation. And so basically here, uh, there's not really an equation you could just write out that expresses this notion of filaments and galaxy formation and so forth. There are some simple rules under the hood, but understanding whether or not all of the rules uh, and initial conditions you have are correct, uh, what you do is you set up a simulation like this, you run it for some period of time, and then you compare it to the universe that you can see. So what are the things that are 7 billion, uh, that, that are emitting light that was 7 billion years old? Let's look at those and maybe let's see how much they match the kinds of uh, galaxies that we see forming here, uh, as well as the filamentous structure connecting between them, right? So in that sense, science, uh, it's a, one of the major pillars of science today is simulation. And this sort of thing clearly is only possible through some sort of sophisticated data structures, or in this case, algorithms uh, that will allow us to simulate uh, in-body gravitational attraction among enormous numbers of objects. You may not have uh, science at mind, so another, another great example of where we can use data structures and algorithms uh, are just in the production of art, as aesthetic concerns. And so here's a video that I seem to always show. It's uh, someone building fluid simulations just so we can we could see what might be possible. This is a soundtrack here. There's some kind of block. I don't, I'm not in the Alright, so here's some black liquid. It's pretty thin here. It's gonna be black liquid, that's a better phrase. Wine glass? Oh, it just got shot. That's bad. What a mess. But it was simulated. So you saved yourself all that trouble. And we can see it slower. So you can build all kinds of really cool food flow simulations or whatever else you might want to do. Yeah, so, you know, maybe check this out. It's how it feels to you. Uh, here, uh, this is another simulation someone put together. So if you wanted to know what it's like to just hang out on a virtual beach watching some uh, slop slop around. Again, there's some algorithm here generating this, this fluid flow here. This wouldn't otherwise be possible. And then lastly, another reason that you might find this class interesting is just the, the topic is itself really interesting. So it doesn't have to be a means to an end, but it can be here, uh, for example, something you find fun. So what is going on here? Well, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to draw this house, but it turns out you can draw this house here by putting your pencil down on a piece of paper and drawing the lines in the right order so that you get that house. And maybe this is a good time to pause the video and see if you can do it. And you'll see it's tricky, but I promise you it is possible. Now it turns out that this is a very old problem there's a classic problem called the Seven Bridges of Königsberg. And the question is, is there a way to cross these seven bridges exactly once without using any bridge twice? And without too much effort or time, you can eventually convince yourself it is actually impossible to do. And um, it turns out that these two problems are essentially the same. There's the house drawing problem, and there is the seven bridges problem. But it turns out that the shapes of the universes are different so that the house is possible, but the bridges are not. And so one of the things we'll talk about in this class is a data structure known as a graph, which is a great way to bring these two examples into the same context 
Uh, and this would be the graph version of the seven bridges. And the graph virgin, version of the house would be uh, something slightly different. And so you might ask yourself, what's special about the house that makes it possible, but the seven bridges of Königsberg impossible? Uh, and so once we've got a little more understanding of graphs, that's a question you'll eventually be able to answer. Though, uh, spoiler alert, we will not actually cover this specific question. Okay, so that's just kind of a broad overview of what this class is really all about. Uh, and so if you were at my house, which I don't believe you are, uh, I would ask you what you hope to uh, learn from this class, but we'll do that in a live lecture and uh, I'll, I'll learn something about it and I'll add the answers to the slide later. I would also like to know who you are. Uh, and again, I can't really ask you directly, but you know, hey, uh, if you come to live lecture, I'll be asking about who's a freshman, who's a sophomore, who's done what kind of CS, uh, but I can tell you a little about, about who we are. So all that said about what the class is about, I'm Josh Hug, by the way. Uh, so I'm teaching professor here. This is my office. Uh, I will have my office hours on Mondays from two to three and uh, four to five, and those will be on the website. And be, feel free to drop by whenever, so happy to meet up. And even if it's not something specifically about data structures, in fact, I tend to prefer questions that are not specifically just 61B, just for variety. Uh, and we also have a number of GSIs. In fact, we have 49 GSIs. I will not even say all their names because it would take too long, but thank you, GSIs. We also have a bunch of tutors. Uh, the tutors will be there to teach mostly small sections for those of you who want a little more practice uh, with the fundamentals. And then we also have a bunch of academic interns, around 163 at this moment. Uh, there is, in fact, so many academic interns, you may not be able to take it all in. And so instead, I have for you the letter distributions of the names of our TAs. And interestingly, when I did this two years ago, it was almost the exact same distribution. Although I guess maybe that's not so surprising because, you know, law large numbers. But anyway, uh, here you go. Here are your lab assistants. Uh, we appreciate you all as individuals, but I have reduced you to a histogram.